Welcome to Mr Mar History. In today's video, we are going to be discussing Scotland and its role in the Atlantic slave trade. In amongst Glasgow Museum's many collections of art, there is a family portrait from the 1760s. It shows a well-off group with both parents and children. But that's not actually the full picture. In the background, almost invisible from view, is another figure. This was the Glassford family personal slave. It was a young boy snatched from his life in Africa. The painting is symbolic of Scotland's history. It's a country that's proud of its past, but often with a tale that's only partly known. Scots can easily name the country's many proud achievements, but they're often unaware of the more sinister elements which are also part of its heritage. For decades, Scots were heavily involved in the Atlantic slave trade. It was an experience which brought misery to the slaves, but a great many benefits to Scotland, including wealth, jobs and a changing landscape. So what was the Atlantic slave trade? The Atlantic slave trade began in the late 1400s and continued until the 1800s. This involved the kidnapping of Africans and then taking them to the Americas. Once in the Americas, they were forced to work in various locations. This included large plantations, but also extended to homes, factories and mines as well. The slave trade was often known as the triangular trade because of the three journeys which were involved. In the first part, Slave ships would leave European countries carrying various goods which were then sold or traded in Africa, in exchange for the Africans who would become slaves. These goods included guns, gunpowder, copper, pots and pans and cloth. During the second stage of the journey, also known as the Middle Passage, the Africans were transported across the Atlantic to their new homes in the Americas, including locations such as the Caribbean, United States and Brazil. The Middle Passage saw Africans endure terrible conditions including overcrowding, violence and even rape. Many of them would die before they ever reached the Americas. Once in the Americas, the Africans were sold as slaves, mainly at auctions but also sometimes at a scramble. They were then taken to work in locations such as farm plantations as well as factories and mines. Life as a slave could be brutal. In addition to long working hours in hot conditions, slaves had to endure harsh physical punishment and poor living conditions, such as overcrowded housing. The final stage of the triangular trade saw the goods produced by the slaves transported back to Europe to be sold, before the whole process started again. Slave products that were sold in Europe included sugar, cotton, coffee, and also tobacco. So how did Scotland get involved in the Atlantic slave trade? The slave trade originally involved the first countries to colonise the Americas, which was Spain and Portugal. However, later other countries, including France, the Netherlands and England, also participated. At first Scotland had no role in the slave trade. This was largely due to the fact that it had no overseas empire. Scotland had attempted to establish an overseas colony in Panama in the late 1690s as part of what was known as the Darien Scheme. This had been done in the hope of creating huge wealth, but instead was an abject failure and it essentially bankrupted the country. In 1707, England and Scotland joined together to create the Kingdom of Great Britain and this was partly as a consequence of the economic problems that Scotland faced after the problems in Panama. In joining with England, Scotland was able to gain access to England's overseas colonies, and this would lead to Scotland and Scots playing a central role in the slave trade. This was done in various ways, including establishing businesses that benefited from slave labour, and also working in jobs that made use of slave products. We are now going to consider all the different ways that Scotland benefited from the trade, starting off with the issue of wealth. 
There was lots of different ways that Scots made their money and became rich through the slave trade, and one of them was slave ownership. A great many Scots were incredibly wealthy as a result of this. Some of them were owners of slaves, even though in many cases they had never left Scotland and would never in their life actually come into contact with a slave. Many of these people essentially bought a share in a slave and the produce that they would make each year. The Scots then used this to gain an annual income and for some people this was done in place of a pension. When slavery was outlawed in the British Empire in 1833, the owners of these slaves received compensation for the loss of their so-called property. The records of these payments highlight that all around Scotland there were slave owners, whether owning hundreds or perhaps only two or three. Examples of this include an Alexander Glenny from Aberdeen who owned 235 slaves and Gilbert McNabb from Ayr who had 103 slaves. In contrast, John Cameron from Argyll and Mary Cobham from Edinburgh each owned only two slaves. In total, 748 people with Scottish addresses are listed as receiving compensation for slavery's abolition, but the number of Scots is likely to be much higher based on addresses of people living out with the country but who were in fact born in Scotland. Another way that Scots made their wealth was in the process of capturing Africans. They would do so before they would then sell them on for a huge fortune. Some Scots set up and owned slave forts in Africa. These were prison type locations where kidnap Africans would be held until they could be transported to the Americas. Conditions in the slave forts were very difficult. There was overcrowding, disease and many Africans would die before they ever actually set foot on a slave ship. Some Scottish slave fort owners include Richard Oswald and Alexander Grant. In the 1750s, they set up a trading post on Bants Island in the Sierra Leone River. It's estimated that this one slave company oversaw 13,000 Africans being sent to the Americas. Another example was Archibald Dale from Kirtliston, who ran various slaving depots in Africa. There were slave forts right across the west coast of Africa, and Scots found numerous job opportunities in them, including as guards and also as clerks dealing with the administration. Other Scots' fortunes was made through their ownership of plantations in the Americas. Although some slaves worked in places like mines and factories, the majority of slaves in the Americas worked on plantations where they grew crops that were sold back in Europe. Owners of these plantations could amass huge fortunes through the sale of goods such as sugar, cotton, coffee and tobacco. There are numerous examples of Scots owning plantations, including Sir James Stirling of Keir from Perth, whose family owned three plantations in Jamaica, and also James Lindsay from Edinburgh, who built a fortune of slave and plantation ownership. Sir John Wedderburn, originally from Perthshire, was a powerful plantation owner. His estates accounted for around 10% of all land in Jamaica. To gain an idea of the scale of Scottish involvement, when St Kitts in the Caribbean became part of Britain's empire, half of the land divisions of 100 acres or more went to Scots. In addition, it is also estimated that around one third of all plantations in Jamaica were owned by people from Scotland. Other Scots didn't directly own slaves or plantations, but nevertheless their wealth owed itself to the existence of slavery. Numerous Scots established businesses at home and abroad that sold slave produce, or were connected in other ways to the trade. The merchants of Glasgow made fortune from selling various products, most famously tobacco. Whilst they may not have owned or even met a slave, they certainly benefited from the existence of slavery. The sugar company Tate and Lyle, which is still in existence today, was set up by Abram Lyle from Greenock. Much of its wealth was from sugar that was grown by plantation slaves in the Americas. Another prominent example was the Bank of England, Britain's official bank. This was established by a Scot named William Patterson with the intention of funding businesses, including those that worked in the slave trade. 
There were also many small-scale businesses and business owners that were involved in different stages of the trade, whether transporting or selling the goods. All of this created much wealth in Scotland for large numbers of people. However, Scotland's involvement in the slave trade wasn't simply about those that became rich. Many people simply found they had jobs as a result of the trade. Let's firstly look at examples of the jobs that took place in Scotland. Many people in Scotland would never have met a slave, or perhaps even know the story of slavery, but their jobs still existed because of the slave's work. Various products were grown and made by slaves, in particular sugar, cotton, coffee and tobacco. These were brought to Scotland and were then used in various different ways. There were sugar refineries around Scotland, including in Ayr and Greenock. Sugar refineries needed workers to change the sugar beet into the refined sugar that can be sold to the public. This involved workers boiling the sugar until it was ready for sale. Cotton mills in Scotland also relied upon cotton that was grown by slaves in the Americas, and this meant that jobs in these Scottish mills had a direct connection to the suffering of people who had been taken to America. Scotland had numerous cotton mills, including in places such as Paisley, New Lanark and Glasgow. The slave trade also created jobs in storage and transport. Workers were required at the docks to take slave products off the ships and then transport them into stores or places such as the sugar refineries and factories. Different Scottish docks saw the unloading of slave ship cargoes, including many on the Clyde, Leaf near Edinburgh and also Dundee. This was a huge business. In 1761, 47 million pounds of tobacco came into Scottish ports before being sent for sale elsewhere. And of course people had jobs in shops selling these various products to the public. Perhaps the least obvious jobs connection to slavery was in the fishing industry. Fishermen, especially in the northeast of Scotland in places like Montrose, caught fish such as herring that was then transported to Africa and the Americas as food for the slaves. Scots also found that there were different job opportunities if they went to the Americas. These Scots would certainly have been much more aware of slavery because in finding work in places like the Caribbean, they would regularly have come into contact with slaves. Some of those Scots worked directly with slaves on the plantations. This included overseers who were in charge of the slaves, many of whom would eventually go on to set up their own plantations. Others worked in jobs that were crucial to the maintenance of the slave trade. This included doctors, lawyers, teachers and others who provided services to the plantation workers and their families. Scots formed a huge part of this workforce. In 1750, more than half of all doctors on Antigua were Scottish or Scottish trained, a pattern many people believe was found in other Caribbean islands. Many Scots played a role in the governance of the Caribbean too becoming politicians such as governors, or as civil servants who worked for these politicians. There were also job opportunities to be found on the slave ships. The slave ships were a rich source of employment for Scots, and not simply on Scottish or British owned ships. Although small in number compared to English ports, Scottish ports such as Port Glasgow, Leith, Montrose and Greenock witnessed the departure of ships that then transported the slaves. On board, some Scots were sailors on the slave ships, moving the slaves and the goods that they produced. Others acted as ship surgeons, and in many cases, Scots rose to the rank of captain. Scots seemed to have a particularly major role as captains. Of 128 ship captains who sailed from Liverpool in the late 1700s and who gave their nationality, 25 of them were Scottish, which is around 1 in 5 of the total. Records from other countries' ships, including ships from the Netherlands, also show that many Scots served on board, including as captains. Slave ships also provided work in the form of shipbuilding. Although places like Liverpool and England were at the centre of building these ships, some ships that were built in Scotland were used in the slave trade, including from places such as Ayr. It wasn't just in wealth and jobs that slavery had a clear impact on Scotland. In 
the countries, cities, towns and countryside also had the clear effects as well. In fact, even when visiting some of these places today, you can still find connections to the slave trade. Glasgow is the clearest example of this. Numerous buildings and street names can be traced back to the city's involvement with slavery. The merchants of Glasgow used their huge wealth to build impressive homes and other buildings, not least in the merchant city area of the city centre. The Gallery of Modern Art, a grand building in Royal Exchange Square which is now most famous for the statue with a traffic cone on its head, was originally built as a home, using money from slave produce. The city's street names also link back to slavery. Buchanan Street was named after Andrew Buchanan, who made a fortune from the tobacco trade and was later Glasgow's Lord Provost. Glassford Street was named after John Glassford, another tobacco seller. His family even had their own African slaves, as earlier mentioned in the painting at the start of this. Ingram Street and Dunlop Street are also named after the merchants who built the Glasgow we know today. Other parts of the city centre also allude to slave links, including Virginia Street, D Jamaica Street and the Kingston Bridge, each showing connections with the Caribbean. But it's not just Glasgow that has a story like this. Some parts of Edinburgh have fancy buildings and homes which were paid for using proceeds from the slave trade whether through the sale of products or slaves themselves. This includes the new town area in particular. Aberdeen also had inhabitants who made money from slavery and then used this to fund buildings. For example, the city's power skates were funded from slave produce income and in fact they even include carvings of slaves on them, alluding to their history. It's not just Scotland's cities where those involved in the trade lived and spent their money. Richard Oswald, who owned slave forts in Africa, had a grand home near Ayr, which today is known as Oswald Hall. In fact, in recent years, there's been a debate in Scotland about whether or not places that have the name of slavers should have their titles changed. Other merchants used their wealth to buy grand estates, such as Alexander Hutchison and Robert Allison, who owned land in the Mairns area near Glasgow and a train or car journey through Greenock even today passes large warehouses, which were in fact used to store the sugar that was brought from the Caribbean before being sold. Another impact on Scotland of the slave trade was to do with the country's schools and hospitals. Many people who had made their money from the slave trade would have been well thought of when they were alive. Some of these people were philanthropists, and they used their money to set up schools, which helped improve education in Scotland, or instead to fund hospitals. John McNabb was from a poor family, but he grew up to be rich through ship ownership, and this included some ships that were used to transport slaves and the goods they produced. McNabb used his money to set up Dollar Academy, a school in Clickmanninshire. Another example of this is James Gillespie. He sold tobacco, and he then subsequently used much of his wealth to set up a school in Edinburgh, which is named after him and still open today. Furthermore, John Newlands of Bathgate moved to the Caribbean as a carpenter, but later became a plantation and slave owner. He eventually used some of his money to set up Bathgate Academy. Another man whose wealth benefited Edinburgh was Dr Archibald Kerr who owned a plantation and slaves in Jamaica. When he died in 1750, he left his fortune to Edinburgh's Royal Infirmary, thus helping improve health care in the city. It's worth noting that not all Scots who had slave trade links did so voluntarily, at least not at first. Many Scots who went to the Americas did not choose this life, but instead they were sold or sent as part of their prison punishment. For example, in the 1700s, the Jacobites were a group of Scots that wanted to change the monarch of Scotland and Britain, and they took part in various rebellions against the British government. Many of them were subsequently transported as part of their punishment, and sent to places such as the Caribbean to carry out their sentence. Other Scots were actually sold, to be taken to the Americas as workers, 
They were known as indentured servants. Some of them were Highlanders who were thrown off their land to make way for sheep during an event known as the Highland Clearances. Others were often children, sometimes orphans, that were simply kidnapped and then sent abroad. This includes a time in the 1740s when 700 children were kidnapped in Aberdeen with the support of some of the city's politicians. One of them became known as Indian Peter and he eventually made it back to Scotland. The existence of Scots as indentured servants has sometimes led people to claim that many Scots were in fact slaves. However, this is not fully accurate. Indentured servants certainly were treated poorly, sometimes in the same cruel manner that slaves were. However, often they did not suffer the same level of brutality and punishment that African slaves did. And there was one other key difference. African slaves, and their children, were the property of their owner for their entire lives, without the promise of freedom. However, Scottish indentured servants were only tied to their owner for a fixed period, usually three to seven years, after which they were freed to build their own lives and make their own choices. In addition, their children would not automatically become slaves. Furthermore, many of those Scots that had been indentured servants themselves eventually became plantation and slave owners. Although slavery mainly took place in the Americas, some people instead brought slaves from Africa to Scotland. There are various examples of African slaves living in grand Scottish homes, working in roles such as cooks, cleaners, maids and butlers. Slaves were quite openly sold in Scotland, with adverts appearing in local newspapers one such advert, from a 1769 edition of the Edinburgh Advertiser, described a handsome black boy, about 13 years of age, very well qualified for making a household servant. However, in 1788, Scotland eventually banned the owning of slaves, in Scotland at least. One judge argued that men were men regardless of their skin colour. This followed the case of Joseph Knight, a slave who worked for the Scotsman John Wedderburn, who sued for and then won his right to freedom. However, in spite of the trade being banned in Scotland, it remained perfectly legal for Scots to own slaves in the Americas for more than half a century after this. Scotland was also heavily involved in arguments and debates about whether or not the slave trade should be allowed to continue. Some Scots actively campaigned to keep slavery, Various Scottish businessmen and politicians lobbied hard to persuade MPs not to outlaw the trade, highlighting all of the various benefits that Scotland had gained. This included Henry Dundas from Edinburgh, who still to this day has a statue in the city. Many of these people set up groups to campaign in favour of slavery, including the Glasgow West India Association. However, Many other people across Scotland were violently opposed to slavery, for a multitude of reasons. These were sometimes religious or moral objections, or even based on the belief that slavery was not economically successful. These people participated in working against the trade in different ways. They often participated in public meetings, or in writing newspaper letters, or in organising petitions, and other ways too. One example was Zachary Macaulay from Inverary. He had worked in the Caribbean and saw for himself the evils of the trade. In 1823 he helped set up the Anti-Slavery Society and he also produced anti-slavery materials. Another campaigner was William Dixon from Moffat. Like Macaulay, he had worked in the Caribbean and on his return went on a tour of Scotland describing what he witnessed and urging an end to the trade. Dixon distributed examples of anti-slavery medallions, such as those made famous by the abolitionist Josiah Wedgwood. Another man to speak against slavery was the Scottish economist Adam Smith. In his book The Wealth of Nations, Smith argued that slavery was actually damaging Scotland and the world's economy, and so should be ended. Although Britain abolished the slave trade in 1807 and then slavery itself in 1833, other countries did not. 
Most famously, the USA continued using slaves until the 1860s. One notable campaigner against this was Frederick Douglass, himself a former slave. Douglass took part in a tour of Scotland and other locations in the 1840s, where he spoke about his experiences and urged people to join the campaign to end slavery all around the world. Douglas also said that Scots who had benefited from slave trade wealth, and he identified groups such as the Free Church of Scotland who had raised funds from slavers, should send back the money. It is fair to say, however, though, that if Scotland had sent back all the money it had made from slave trade links, it could well have bankrupted the country. Clearly much of Scotland's wealth, including today, owes itself to the work and suffering of those African people who were given no choice in their lives or actions.